morning, everybody. Thanks for dancing with us, kids. Yeah. Yeah, good job. I saw somebody do a little tumbling over here. That was good. Welcome. I know about half of our church is on vacation. I guess the schools start around here next week, which seems like it's really early. Isn't it? Uh, I know I'm in my 50s and maybe everything has changed, but when I was a kid, we, w we didn't go to school until after, uh, was it Memorial Day, Labor Day, whichever one is coming up. We just didn't. I mean, we had three months to go out and break stuff and cause trouble. Right, Matt? Matt knows. <laughs> three whole months. Anyway, welcome. We've been preaching through a series this summer. We call it uh, Passion and Purity. And so what we've done is I and a couple other folks like Chris and Aaron have come uh, up with just kind of a list of people who we feel have like passion and purity. And so I preached, oh gosh, several people, Mother Mary and Ruth and uh, Aaron and some other folks preached Elijah and Noah. And we really just kind of ran around doing all kinds of stuff. And anybody can just pick whoever they want. Well, this week, I was preaching about Mary Magdalene because, who's ever heard of this? Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. Raise your hand if you ever heard it, even one time. Okay, so as I started researching a um, week or so ago, I started uncovering some truths that I really didn't even understand about the scriptures. And so today, I'm not going to preach about Mary Magdalene. I'm going to preach about an unnamed woman. An unnamed woman, her name is not in the scripture, it doesn't say it anywhere, uh, but we know that she was a sinful woman. So all sinners, raise your hands. Good, excellent, so we got, <laughs> I'm one too. And so we're not really casting dispersions on this woman. I think when you get to the end, you're going to find out that this is really, really an interesting story from the scripture. So anyway, if you have your Bibles today, get ready, turn open to Luke 7, and you go to about verse 30, and I'm just going to do uh, several verses there, but it's all really kind of compacted there in the end of Luke. Um, so anyway, my research, I found that there actually was not one anointing of Jesus by a woman, not two, as some pastors say, but actually three times Jesus was anointed by a woman and for different reasons and different purposes. Now, lots of them have all kinds of purposes, but this one specifically today is a woman who anointed Jesus' feet. She anointed his feet. And so we're going to talk about it. Anyway, one of the anointings happens to be at Bethany. So we know that was at Bethany, and that's a little town not too far from Jerusalem. And we know that one of the anointings was at Simon the leper's house. Now, Simon the leper is often confused with Simon the Pharisee, where another anointing happens. So see, what happened in Scripture, and a lot of times in the New Testament, you know, we get further and further away from things. Sometimes people mold things together in their heads. And so some people have said, oh, no, it's all the same thing. It's all the same time. No, it is not. Because if we start picking through the Bible and deciding what's true and what isn't, then where do we go? Right? It's either infallible and I'm not saying that there isn't a dot somewhere or a dash or a comma or something that it couldn't be translated better. What I'm saying is, is that the scriptures are God-breathed and they come to us for a reason. And so I actually went back and did quite a bit of studying and I am certain now that there were three separate anointings, one here, one there, and one in another place, all by three totally different women. Are you with me? If you don't believe it, you can do your own research, but it'll take you quite a while. There's a lot of stuff out there. Anyway, like I said, it's not Mary Magdalene, and it's not Mary, the sister of Mary, or excuse me, the sister of Martha, and also the sister of Lazarus. That's another anointing that happened. Anyway, they call her a sinful woman. I actually asked my secretary and her daughter to come up with a list of things to, uh, to potentially name this sermon, and they gave me a whole list. And some of them were really funny. I told them, just, just have fun. But one of them was like um, the happy ex-hooker. I didn't think it was good. That's why I didn't use it. But, I, but they came up with a whole list of things like that. What I decided to use was the anonymous anointer. Do you like it? Okay, it wasn't that good, but that's all I got. Anyway, turn with me to Luke 7. In Luke 7, in verse 36, we're going to read about this anointing. Um, they call it, if you look in your Bibles, it probably says, Jesus anointed by a sinful woman. Uh, that's an uninspired text, but it's usually found right above where these verses are. Uh, as we read in verse 36, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. 
When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting, putting perfume on him. Now, I think I have a picture here. Can you go back to the picture, Chris? So this picture is often, this is how we see this in Scripture. We'll see a, a woman, you know, at, down on her knees or laying down, and then Jesus would be like this. But actually, that's not really a, a good picture. I'm not saying the artist didn't do a good job, but it's not a real good depiction of how things went. Uh, back in those days, they would recline at a table instead of sitting at a table like we would. And so there would be like maybe a, an elbow pillow or something like that, or it would be like this. But basically, his feet would probably be behind him, and then the table would be here, or, or the food would be here, and the men or whoever was at the dinner would be circled around. This woman kind of sneaks up, just kind of crawls up, if you will, and begins to weep, begins to cry on Jesus' feet. And so people see it. Um, before I go into the deep part of this, I, I want to make sure that we, we don't miss anything. Um, raise your hand if you've ever gone to dinner that you didn't want to go to. Yeah, there you go. So I like food. Actually, I love food. I love food. But I've often been in, required to go to dinners I didn't really want to go to. You know, some were fundraisers or whatever. And, and I think this is kind of what was going on with Jesus. You know, he gets invited to go to the house of somebody who he doesn't really care for. And the person who invited him doesn't really care for him. And all of the friends that he has invited to see Jesus don't like him either. Uh, in fact, what they want to do is they want to catch him in a trap. They want to ask him questions. They want to watch him and catch him doing anything wrong or saying anything wrong so that they can point out his hypocrisy, then just kind of be done with him and just to count themselves as maybe better than him. Now, in the t those times, a lot of people would go around and preach. And a lot of them were false prophets. And so they basically just wanted to do that to Jesus and say, you know, this, guy's, this guy is a false prophet. Um, so anyway, Simon and the boys invite him over. And uh, I want to make sure you guys understand when I say a Pharisee, we throw that word around the church a lot, but does anybody know what a Pharisee actually is or was? There's a, there's a lot of reading you could do, but, but just to super simplify it, let's look it up in the dictionary. Look at this right here. Pharisee. Noun. Pharisee, a member of an ancient Jewish sect distinguished by strict observance of the tradition or traditional and written law and commonly held to have pretensions of a superiority or sanctity. Or if you will, the second definition, a self-righteous person. Or the last one, everyone say it, a hypocrite, okay? So as soon as you start lifting yourself up, you know, you may be acting all great in the front and everyone sees that Jesus nailed these guys. Over and over, he called them whitewashed tombs. He said there was basically, they're just dead men's bones inside of something that looks great. And he made fun of them. Uh, literally, though, literally, Pharisee could be translated as separated. Separated. Now, we get the word holy from the scriptures. Does anybody know what holy is? We just sang it a couple minutes ago, right? Holy. We throw it around. Holy roller, holy word, holy man of God. You want to translate it, really, probably to our English version? It would just be called out. Called out. So, in a sense, separate, separated, but not in a, oh, look at me way, but more in a God has saved me way. <laughs> like, I've been called out by the, by the God of the universe, and now I'm, I'm supposed to be about something different. I'm supposed to be about loving God and loving people. Are you with me? So, literally, Pharisee means separated. But what Jesus did is he came on the scene and he started doing exactly the opposite of what the Pharisees were doing. Now he would teach as they would teach. He would go in the synagogues and wow everybody. But the crowd that started to come around him was anyone but the people that the Pharisees would have around them. In fact, they wouldn't be caught dead around the people who hung around Jesus. In fact, they called him, they called him a guy who hung around with low lives. They said he was a drunk they said he was uh, probably a thief and a false prophet. They said all kinds of things, but specifically they aimed uh, accusations at him because of the people he hung around with. Well, I will admit to you, if you hang around with the wrong kind of people, you'll probably start to take on their ways. But that's not what he was doing here because he is holy, right, separate, but at the same time then reaching back 
to the people who need him. Um, you think a hooker was a low life? Because we're going to read about this woman who we all believe from the scriptures was a prostitute, or at least an ex-prostitute. But in those days, there was someone worse than a prostitute. I mean, a prostitute was probably just caught up in something. Who knows what caused her to be there? Maybe she was raped when she was little. And in that culture, you know, that was a really bad thing to have happened to you. And then you couldn't marry in most cases. Or, or maybe she was molested. I mean, who knows what happened? Maybe her parents died and she was brought up into slavery. We don't know. But the next person, the kind of people Jesus hung around with, the tax collectors, they were straight up filthy. They were. Because they were Jews who decided to turn code on their own people. And when you're a Jew, I mean, that's a big deal. You don't turn your back on your own people, even today. And yet, not only did they do that, but they aligned themselves with the Roman government. And so they became tax collectors for Rome, and then they would be the hands and feet, if you will, of the IRS. But they were way worse than that. What they would do is they'd come up and say, you owe this much, uh, and you also have to give this much more, and this much more, and this much more. And they would rob their own people. Rob their own people. So here you have a guy who comes on and claims to be a prophet who's hanging around with prostitutes, tax collectors, and all kinds of horrible people. Now, before I get too far into it, I want to read you a verse. This is Luke 5. You can go back if you want to read it or just read it with me. Luke 5, 27. Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? And Jesus answered them, healthy people do not need a... Who does? Sick people. Sick people need a doctor. And so that is the way Jesus thought, and that's the way he took things on. Now, this is a dinner I think he wanted to be at. A dinner with a bunch of people who were throwing out their old garbage and taking on the new and trying to walk with him. And, and the Pharisees are out there making fun of him. And so Levi, if you don't know this, becomes Matthew. <laughs> Changes his name to Matthew and becomes the author of the New Testament book that we have the Gospel of Matthew or St. Matthew, and does all kinds of amazing things. Anyway, tradition says this woman who sneaks up behind Jesus was a brothel owner. If I read and can understand what was going on, it appears to me that she probably was in the city or around the city as Jesus was teaching and going to these events and talking, and she heard his message. Somewhere she heard his message. We don't know from the scriptures, but that's what it appears like. Um, and somehow, along the way, she quit doing what she was doing. Uh, I read some books this week that said it appears that she shut down her brothel so that she would have had some kind of brothel near uh, the temple where the Gentiles would hang out by the temple. And somehow she shut it down, and she it, essentially repented, it appears. Because what she does is she recognizes Jesus as God incarnate. She recognizes it. Now, did the Pharisees recognize that? No, because they're too high and mighty, right? They're too high and mighty. But somehow she recognizes them. And so what happens is she acknowledges her own sin. She acknowledges her own sin, and she acknowledges God, and she humbly presents the ruins of herself to God incarnate. How does she do it? Well, she does it in a pretty humble way. The first thing she does is she takes her most valuable possession. Now, I don't want to be crass, but her most valuable possession was her body. I mean, that's how she made her money. Uh, that's the position that she found herself in. However she got there, I don't know. But she took her own body. But it's more than just her body, right? I mean, we all love our bodies, even if we don't like the shape of them all the time or the way they feel. We do love ourselves, and the scriptures say we love that. And so she presents her body, not as a sexual thing, but as a human being. But then, if that's her most valuable possession, she also takes her most valuable earthly possession, which was this alabaster jar of perfume. She takes it, and we'll see in the scripture that she pours it out. It was probably worth a year's wages, and she didn't care. You know, she's anointing the feet of Jesus. 
This is amazing. Uh, to me, I was reading this week, and it seems like probably what she did with that perfume was to anoint herself. I mean, that's what you do with perfume, right? I mean, I know I have daughters. You know, when they're getting ready to go out, the whole house smells like this stuff, right? She, you know, it's all over the place. Well, she's anointing herself. But now she goes, and she anoints the Son of God. And then I suspect, if I'm reading right, it appears that a prostitute, or even sometimes maybe a wife or somebody who loves someone, would anoint the head of someone. So sit down, I anoint your head with oil. It's like in the 23rd Psalm, right? We read about this, but in the Middle East it was kind of a, a custom and something was very important. And this was happening probably with customers of hers. But now not anointing his head, she's anointing his feet, right? You'll see that she also says no words. She says no words. And sometimes that's the way we need to approach God without any words. And besides, Jesus already knows anyway, right? I mean, you're really broken. Do you really need to say anything? I mean, do you need to just cough out all the things you ever did? Maybe sometimes you do. Sometimes I need to do that with the brother or with somebody else. But I think probably when you just totally get broken, Jesus already knows, and you just lay down and you begin to cry. Um, I had a, probably a bad illustration, but I was reading a couple weeks ago about the uh, famous website Ashley Madison. I won't go into great detail, but they perform a very horrible service. Uh, in our country, and they got hacked. They got hacked. Somebody hacked them, and so now they have all the names of all their customers, and they're threatening to release them. In fact, they are releasing some, and people are freaking out because their worst sin, if you will, is being put out on the internet for all to see. And I was using that illustration because I can imagine, can you just imagine, that everyone knows your sin. Everyone considers you worthless. Everyone would call you a harlot, if you will. And that is the woman that we're reading about. She didn't just, she wasn't able to even sneak in. I mean, she may have crawled in, but what she did is she comes humbly with everyone knowing her sin, and she approaches the feet of God with nothing else but herself and her most prized earthly possession. Are you ready to read some more? I mean, are you set up for this? Well, the, boy, the boys weren't. They just didn't get it. So as she's doing this, Luke 7.39 says this, When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. So that's the thing about Pharisees. He's seeing this amazing act. He's seeing this woman come in and, and weeping on the feet of God. And, and drying it with her hair and, and pouring this perfume out into this humble creature laying there broken. And what do they see? Slut. And if this guy was any kind of a prophet, he would know it. You see, the thing about Pharisees, these separatists, if you will, they can always see everyone else's sin. <laughs> see, everyone else's sin is in Panavision, Right? And we're like that too. I mean, we can't be too quick to say, oh, that's the Pharisees. We are real quick to see everyone else's sin, but it's much more difficult for us to see our own. As I was studying this week, I, I didn't know this, but it was specifically the Pharisees who required a woman of ill repute to keep her hair down. She wasn't allowed to put her hair up. Now, a woman in those days would put their hair up. They would grow it long, but then they would keep it up. And so when you were out, I'm not sure of all their attire, but it appears they would wear some type of a robe or something. Their hair would be up. But a, a harlot or a woman who worked in this kind of an industry was forced to keep her hair down, if you will, as a badge of dishonor among the people in the street. The religious people, if they saw her with their hair up, would demand that she took it down. And so I, I didn't know that, but I'm like, wow, this is amazing. So they forced them to do that? But these people could see all of that. They could see who she was, and they could stand in judgment of her, but they couldn't see Jesus was God. And I think those things kind of go together. When you're so busy looking at everyone else's sin, do you really see God? Or does yourself kind of get up on the throne? Doesn't it? It's not what offends God. It's kind of what offends me. And that's, I think, what's happening here. And sometimes I'm a pastor, so people drop a, you know, a whatever bomb. You know, like, oh, sorry, pastor. I said, you're not offending me. And I just hit the golf ball or whatever's going on. There is a lot of cussing on the golf course, if you didn't know. Why, why would I say they're not offending me? 
I mean, I don't like it, but if you drop a GD, who are you offending? Right. See, it's not about me. It's not about me. I don't like it when people say Jesus as a, as a cuss word. I really don't like that because it's my friend and my savior. And I'm not saying that I, that I would just say you're not offending me, but I, I, I hope you see my point. Often I think it's us that get offended and we take the place of God. The people also, because of their pomposity and the way that they looked at the world, they, they couldn't see past themselves. They couldn't see past themselves. It's them who had the hugest problem. And so anyway, Jesus hears their conversations or he knows their thoughts. And in Luke 7, he says this. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Oh, by the way, he does this a lot of time in scriptures. They think something and he answers it. That must be really freaky. Because right? if Jesus answered some of the things I think, you probably wouldn't want me as your pastor. In fact, I know you wouldn't. But that's what he would do. He hears their thoughts and he answers them. He says this, Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him a story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? And Simon answered, I love this, uh, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. And I just imagine my teenagers, when I, when I quiz them on something, they're like, and they know I'm right, they're like, well, uh, I suppose, Dad, that you're right. <laughs> maybe, maybe, I'm sorry, These some of my kids are sitting here. But I, that's what happens. And I see this Pharisee, and Jesus says, that's right. That's right. Who would, who would love him more? The one who's been forgiven more. And who would love him the least? The one who's forgiven the least. But the reality is they both need forgiveness exactly the same. That's the problem. The Pharisee needs it just as much because every time she may have been with somebody who wasn't her husband, he's with somebody judging somebody else. That's what happens. And I'm not saying one is worse or one is the other. They're both bad. They're both wrong. And I've found it 10,000 times in my life if I found it once. The person who's forgiven the most... Love Jesus the most. And the people who think they're self-righteous often might not even be Christians because they don't really think they need them. They don't. Often the person who's doing the most horrible stuff, when they come to God, they have the most amazing ministries because they don't want to go back. They know what it's like. But that's not the way with the righteous because they don't think they need much from God. People like me, I'm not perfect. I'm, I'm not even close to being in the sentence with perfect, but I try to run from sin because I know all about it. And I know the depravity and the destruction, not only to the people around you, but into your own heart, into your own life, into your own family. And, and people who know that want nothing to do with sin. If you don't believe it, open your Bibles this week and read 1 John. People who have been forgiven cannot sin anymore. <laughs> it's not that you can't make a mistake, it's just that you just can't live with it. I mean, you just have to get it right. But that's not what happened here. Um, do you remember another famous Pharisee in the scriptures? Um, his name was Saul. Changed his name to Paul. Right, another famous Pharisee. So he was one of those separatists who thought everything was you know, right in his world because he walked the narrow walk of every single thing that was in the law, and not only the written law, but also the verbal law, and everything was passed down. They kept every single word. I believe there was 1,150 actual laws that they kept every single day and required of other people. But once he met Jesus, he said this, everything, everything I ever thought was awesome, I now count as loss. It's worthless, and he wanted nothing to do with it. Amen? Isaiah prophesied something similar. Isaiah 118. Now come, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them white as wool. And of course, most of us know the scripture where God says that when you come to him, he takes your sins and put them as far as the east is from the... How is that even possible? The east is from the west. I'm a pilot, you know, and I fly a little bit. The east and the west, they're opposite. They're opposite. 
And he, he puts them at opposite ends of infinity. I mean, how is that even possible? I don't know, but I think this might be even harder. He also says he forgets them. God forgets them. What? What about the sin I, I thought about this morning or the thing I did yesterday? Guess where it is? It's gone. The only place it exists is in my head and maybe in the heart, hearts or the heads of the, someone that I hurt. But in God, in Christ, they're gone. He forgets them. Wow. And so the same thing happened with this woman. Luke 7, 44 through 50. Then he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, he looks at the woman and he talks to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, by the way, which was a very common courtesy in those days. But she has washed them with tears or with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she's not stopped kissing my feet. Also, if you've ever been in a Middle Eastern country, they greet each other with a kiss. A kiss. They kiss each other on both sides of the cheek. And Simon didn't do that. It's because he didn't like him. And he didn't offer anyone to wash his feet. And so this woman did it. And, and Jesus says to Simon, you neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. Uh, in those days, you may recall, uh, when Jesus was asking John the Baptist to baptize him, uh, John the Baptist said, no, no. I'm not worthy, right? I'm not worthy. You should be baptizing me. And, 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 and John said, I'm not even worthy to like untie the little strap on, on, your, on your shoe, you know, on your flip-flop. And, and Jesus said, no, it's going to happen. And what, what John was saying was, I'm not, I'm not worthy to be you know, baptizing you. You're the Son of God. You should be baptizing me. I'm the lowest of the lowest slave. Now, I'm not saying slavery is good, and I'm not saying Jesus promoted it because he didn't, but what happened in this culture, if you were a slave and it was your first day on the job, guess what job you would have? Right. <laughs> Washing the feet of the people who came to the house, cleaning the toenails, you know, whatever. That was your job, and eventually you might rise up, you know, to get to maybe do something more amazing, but this was the lowest job any slave could have. And so what is happening here is this woman is going down to the lowest possible place anyone could be. And not only that, she doesn't even dare, like the other people who anoint Jesus, to anoint his head, like would be the custom. She's anointing his feet. And not only is she doing that, but she's pouring out her tears. I think this is a fact. I wrote it down. Fact. Fact. I can't find any other place, so we'll call it a fact unless you can prove me wrong. I believe this is the first time that tears fell on the feet of God. I don't know, maybe his mother cried sometime and, you know, maybe they fell on his feet, but as he's in his ministry and people are crowding around him, I believe this is the first time that tears fell on the actual feet of God. In the New Testament, later we read that a woman's hair is her... Does anybody know the word? A woman's hair is her glory. It's her glory. And in those days, your hair was long and it was a way to kind of cover your body. Maybe if you were you know, alone with your husband, but your hair was your glory. And so then it's saying that, that she takes this glory... This glory that would be worn only in front of maybe her husband. And she starts to wipe and clean the feet of God with her glory. Can you imagine that? If we actually took our glorious selves or what we think is our glory and actually poured it out at the feet of God. Amazing to me. When I was in the military, uh, I was in the Air Force, so we used to make fun of the Navy a lot. In fact, I still would. Um, if you leave me a chance, but uh, in the Navy, there's a saying that someone cusses like a sailor. Have you ever heard that before? <laughs> cusses like a sailor. Well, well, they do cuss pretty bad. The Air Force is pretty bad at it, too. Um, but have you ever heard anyone talk like a hooker? Have you? So you never watch Pretty Woman? Talk like a hooker. 
Why am I writing this down? Why am I saying this? Because in the, in the Navy, if you talk like that and your mama sees it, she's going to want to wash your mouth. That was so, because you got a filthy mouth. Why would this stuff come out of your mouth? God says, really, that actually the way we treat our brothers and our sisters, are, what comes out of our mouths causes great fires and all kinds of tragedies. But imagine now, this woman who used to have this flattery and this talk that could seduce people and, and fill a man's needs, this woman now takes her mouth and she kisses the feet of God incarnate. She's kissing his feet. And I wonder what would happen if we all decided to honor God with our mouths, even somewhere close to that level. Would it be a different place? Would it? Anyway, not too long ago, I was putting something on my Facebook, and a guy who I know pretty well is kind of a funny guy. He used to come to church here a lot. He, uh, I put something on about some of my daughter's boyfriend just kidding around, and he, and he put in the comment, finish him, finish him, Jim. And I thought, that's kind of funny, right? Um, but I think right here is exactly what happens. Jesus finishes Simon. He just does away with him, and here we go. I tell you, Simon, he says, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. She, so she has shown me much love, but a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And she left, as far as we can tell. I got a scripture I'm going to show you in a minute. I got a kind of an idea maybe where she went. But, but before I share that, I want to just point out some things that I sense that the Pharisees missed. They just missed. And the Pharisee in all of us, sometimes I think potentially we might miss these things as well. Number one, they missed the Savior. They missed the whole point. God incarnate. Emmanuel, God with us, the Savior of all mankind, they just completely missed it. But they also missed the spectacle. And I'm not talking about they couldn't see that a prostitute crawled in there and was making a fuss at their dinner party. They could see that spectacle. What they couldn't see is the spectacle of a woman so broken that everyone knows her sin that she crawls in and she's crying at the feet of Jesus, weeping and pouring out her most precious possession. They missed that. They also missed the repentance. They missed the contrition in her heart. Couldn't they see it? Couldn't they see what happened? That this woman, that everyone knew what was up, and she crawls in there, and this, this heart that she has is saying, God, I'm sorry for what I've done. And this is a big word, the expiation. Uh, basically means, you know, she's making a reparation, if you will. She's going to him with all she has and saying, take this, take this. This is all I have. It's an act of atonement, if you will. But he's saying, no, no, I'm atoning you. I'm dying for you. And the Pharisees missed all of it. And they missed the love. They missed the love. I mean, how do you go to someone in that kind of a way without having an amazing love? without having your heart just beaming and realizing that you were once lost and now you're found. You were a sinful, horrible person. You did all these things and now you're new. You're brand new. Though your sins are like scarlet, now they're white as snow, right? They missed the whole thing. They missed the grace. Grace. Unmerited favor. They thought you had to earn it. They thought you had to go get it. They thought you had to just live your life in such a way, in such a stoic way that no one could ever count anything against you and then God would like you. Well, good luck if you're trying to do that. But you won't be able to do it. You won't be able to do it for one day or one minute because as soon as you call your brother a fool or you look at somebody like they're lower than you, you've sinned. You have. And so they had to, and they missed the grace, the whole point of the thing. And a few months ago, I taught about propitiation. I'll leave it today, <laughs> basically. They missed the propitiation too, and if you don't know what that is, shame on you for not being here and listening. Okay, propitiation is like when I give my wife roses and say, baby, I'm sorry. You know, an act, an act where I'm just offering something to her. And I think they miss this as well. They miss the pardon. They miss the pardon. The pardon. Though her sins were many, he just looked at her and said, they're forgiven. Go. You're free. 
You're free indeed. Anyway, as I close, I wanted to give you something. I'm basically making up this, which is not something I like to do in the scriptures, but I think I know where she went. The scripture never talks about her again. Luke 8, 1 through 3, which is the verse right after the one I just read. Soon afterward, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages. Now, that's the first thing that gives me a hint that it wasn't one of the other anointings, but the other ones were anointing him for his death. This one, he still had ministry to do. And so we know it had to be at least six months because he went out and he taught. It says he was preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom. He took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women who had been cured of evil diseases and uh, spirits and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from who he had cast out seven demons. It was the same woman he would have just said in the same woman, wouldn't he? No, that's not what happened. Mary Magdalene. And he also names Joanna, the wife of Chusa, which is Herod's business manager, Susanna. She was coming along. And many others who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. What do I think happened to her? I think she was one of them. Following him around, pouring herself out for him every day and serving him. Why? Well, she had nothing else. Pretty much that's where I found myself when I met the Lord. Do you think you got everything? Then you wind up realizing you have nothing. And then you realize all of a sudden that you have everything. But it's not what you thought you had. It's a whole new thing. And I suspect that's where she was. Either way, we don't know her. And we don't even know her name. But as I was praying about it and thinking about it, I realized that it doesn't really matter, does it? Because God knows her name. And not only does he know her name, her name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Her name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I wonder if Simon the Pharisee ever got his name in that book. I wonder if his name, no matter how pompous he was and how humble people had to come to him in his dinner parties, I wonder if his name is in that book. And that really is what cuts it right there and why I decided to preach this sermon. Because if you don't know Jesus, as all those things I said they missed, then you don't know him. And if you're trying to get to God by your own great desire and and great works, then you'll never get there. Because the only way to approach God is in absolute perfection. Without that, you'll never see God. Never. Uh, If you're here today and you're saying, hey, I don't know what this guy's talking about, but you want to ask me questions, I hope you would. Take your comment card and write on there that you know I want to talk to you or this is a small crowd today I'd just come up and talk to me I would love to answer your questions I know this though with all of my heart it changed everything about me and made me a pastor God made me do it because of this truth I know I'm a sinner and I know that without the blood of Jesus Christ I would die and pay for my own sin and as a result of his blood as a result of the cross I now do not have to do that I can simply approach him and say, God, accept me, not based on anything I ever did or said, but based on the blood of your son. I have nothing else to offer. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the crowd you have today and those you brought to hear your word. Lord, earlier we, we prayed that, that your mighty wind would blow and I'm just moved, God, that maybe it's not wind that needs to blow around this room, but maybe it just needs to blow inside of our hearts, every one of us. God, change us to be the people you call us to be. Help us to love you. And and in that, God, what we need to do is obey your commands. They're not burdensome. They're just awesome, and they give us life. Help us to see that and to do that. And Father, I also pray that you would help us to love one another, that our eyes would be off of ourselves uh, and lifting ourselves up, and that our eyes would be off of the sins of other people and put on our own sin, and that we could see that in the way you see it, and it would break our hearts in the way it breaks your heart. God, that you would lift us up. Lift us up to a place where we can look down and see your work all over. Help us to be involved in that work. And Father, if there's anyone here today who does not know you as their personal 
God. Jesus, if there's someone here today that does not know you as their Savior and their Lord, I pray that you would blow your mighty wind in their heart and they would see and believe. And I pray it in Jesus' name and in his precious blood. Amen. Amen.